Hello, David Snowpack here from Snowpack Games, and this is part 11 in a tutorial series about implementing rollback netcode in a game built with the Godot game engine. Last time, we talked about how to generate random numbers in a rollback safe way, how to reduce RNG related artifacts, and the Johnny Appleseed approach to avoiding having to exchange a ton of seeds. This time, we're going to talk about how to do more advanced input prediction. In our demo currently, we're doing super simple input prediction. We're basically duplicating the last frame's input with the exception of drop bomb. So if the user was dropping a bomb last frame, we don't assume they're dropping another bomb this frame. This is for a couple of reasons. First of all, they probably aren't dropping a bomb two frames in a row. They'd have to press the button really fast, but it also helps to prevent uh, bad artifacts, which is something we'll talk about more in a moment. But fundamentally, this input prediction code is still pretty unsophisticated. How can we make it better? Well, let's first talk about the purpose of input prediction. Is it to try to accurately predict the most likely thing that the player will do on the next frame? Should we implement AI, machine learning, and statistical analysis? No and no. <laughs> In the comments on one of these videos, someone asked about using hidden Markov models to do input prediction. Uh, hidden Markov models are used in machine learning. I personally actually used them in a natural language processing application years ago. And while it would be so cool to see input prediction done with a hidden Markov model, someone please implement that. I'd love to see it. It'd be such a cool experiment. I strongly suspect that something like that would generate way more artifacts than a much simpler approach, because the goal of input prediction is to generate placeholder input for remote players that will lead to the least noticeable artifacts in the greatest number of situations when the real input finally arrives. So you could predict the statistically most likely input on the next frame, but if that will generate a huge artifact when it's wrong, it's actually a bad prediction because it will have a big negative impact on the player experience. For example, let's say we have an AI model that looks at all the player's past input and predicts that in 90% of cases, the player will drop a bomb on the next frame. So we show them dropping a bomb. But in the 10% of cases where that isn't what the player actually did, that means a bomb will appear and a few frames later will suddenly disappear when the real input arrives. If we assume that bombs have a large impact on gameplay, this would be a big noticeable artifact. In fact, it probably would have been better to not predict that the player dropped a bomb at all and have it suddenly appear a few frames late. That would be a much less disruptive artifact. In fact, most players probably wouldn't even recognize that it's an artifact at all. In the worst case, if the player was moving, the bomb would appear a few pixels behind the player rather than right under them. That's not really a big deal, which leads us directly into our next point. Not all artifacts are equal. There are better and worse artifacts because some are more disruptive than others. For example, like we just talked about, predicting a gameplay changing input and then rolling it back is usually more disruptive than not predicting it at all. Of course, this is game specific. You, as the game developer, need to decide on a case-by-case -case basis which inputs should or shouldn't be predicted in your game. There are trade-offs, and you need to weigh them carefully, probably do lots of playtesting and examining the player experience, because the most important thing to us as game developers is the player experience. Also, overshooting the player position and then snapping them back is usually more disruptive than undershooting their position and snapping them forward. You can actually see this really easily in our demo game when the latency is high. Here we have player one on the top and player two on the bottom. I'm gonna control player two whose position is being predicted on the top, so watch the game on the top. There is a latency of 200 milliseconds, which ends up being about six frames with our simulation FPS. I am holding left and then releasing it, holding right, and then releasing it. You can see that after I've released it, the game predicts that I'm still moving in that direction, but then once the real input arrives, it snaps my character back. This is actually more disruptive if I alternate between pressing like up and left. Look at how much that character bounces around on the top. Yeah, that's a horrible artifact. The solution here is to check this second argument in our input prediction code, ticks since real input. 
and use that to either stop predicting movement if it's over a certain number of ticks since we've gotten real input, or to gradually degrade the input as this number gets bigger. In this code here, if we've predicted more than two ticks in a row, then we remove the input vector. So we're not gonna predict any movement at all. Here's what that looks like in practice. The latency is the same as before, but when I move left and then stop, right and then stop, you can see that the movement is choppier. That's the player getting snapped forward. The effect could be made a little less uh, choppy by gradually degrading the input rather than removing it completely. But I think this is better to make it easier to see for, for learning purposes. But you can see when I stop moving, there still is a little bit of snapping back, but not too much. This is arguably a less disruptive artifact. Players expect that this kind of choppy movement can happen when network conditions are bad, and hopefully they're only temporarily bad. Whereas that big snapping back that we saw earlier is much less expected. Of course, this can vary from game to game. You can choose how you want to handle it in your game. For our little demo game here, I think this is all that I'd personally add to our input prediction to make it better. In a more complex game, there are some more things you might want to do, which is why we're going to take a brief look at the input prediction in my retro tank party game. This is the predict remote input method on the tanks in retro tank party. It starts out simple enough, doing exactly what you would expect, duplicates the previous input, and then we check if the tick sense real input is greater than two, just like the code we added to our demo game. But rather than completely removing the input vector, when it's been more than two ticks in re sense real input, it degrades that input. Um, so the movement vector in Retro Tank Party is analog. Uh, if you're using a controller, you can uh, you know, press forward all the way, or 80%, or 60%. So what we do is every frame past this two ticks, we make it just a little bit less strong. Then after we've degraded it, we quantize that input. So because the input is analog, there's actually like millions of possible values that the input vector could be. How could we possibly predict that correctly? We'd basically get the prediction wrong every single tick and have to roll back every single tick. So one technique that we use to avoid that is rather than having you know, the, the full range of values that the thumbstick is capable of is we quantize that value. We make it have a smaller restricted set of values. So we're doing that up in our gather uh, local input method somewhere up here. I don't see it at the moment. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of code going on, but uh, we're doing it when we gather the input initially. And then here, because we're actually changing the input, we need to do it again to make it at least possible that we could predict what the player is actually doing to reduce the number of rollbacks that we get. Then if we've degraded the input down to zero, we fully remove it. And if not, we set that as our prediction. Then at the end, we are dealing with the turret rotation. So uh, the turret rotation is also analog. Uh, in the PC version, it follows your mouse. Uh, with a controller, of course, it's the thumbstick again. So there's literally like millions of possible rotation values for this turret. How could we possibly predict that? Well, we basically don't. <laughs> so for the uh, turret rotation, its key in the input dictionary is a negative number. And as we learned many, many parts ago, if you use a negative number for a key in the input dictionary, it will not be part of the input hash. That means if the player has a different turret rotation than we predicted, it actually won't trigger a rollback. Now you're probably wondering, how could we possibly shoot accurately if we're not uh, including the turret rotation in the hash? Well, if anything else changes at the same time as the turret rotation that is part of the hash, for example, pressing shoot, then we will trigger a rollback in that case. And that's how the bullets actually go where we expect them to. But because we are not including the turret rotation in the hash, that basically means on the enemy tanks, you will never see their turrets move unless they do some other action that would trigger a rollback. And to avoid that and have their you know, turrets move somewhat naturally, somewhat representing what they really did, we are, uh, rather than you know, duplicating, doing the normal thing we do for input prediction, we are grabbing the latest input that we have for that player's turret rotation, which could be real input, it could be predicted input, it's just the latest thing that we have, and we use that as our turret rotation prediction uh, always. 
Again, it doesn't matter for the hash, but this makes uh, this makes it so if you have you know two people playing next to each other, looking at their individual screens, and you know this one player spins his turret around, the other person will essentially see the same thing. So I think that's all we're going to look at in this video. This doesn't cover every possible technique for improving your input prediction, obviously. We really just looked at some of the principles and a couple examples. You will probably need to experiment and play test to try and find the right balance for your game. Anyway, please let me know if you have any questions in the comments below or on the Snowpack Games Discord or any of the other places that I am on the internet. Next time, we are going to be looking at frame-by-frame -frame debugging. We already looked at debugging state using the state viewer in the log inspector tool that comes with the Godot rollback netcode add-on, but this time we're going to learn about the frame viewer. It's seriously one of the best debugging tools for multiplayer games that I've ever used. It's great for tracking down network issues, performance issues, state mismatch issues, and even just debugging plain old bugs that are hard to reproduce. It's super powerful, and I'm super proud of it. So please subscribe on YouTube. Check out snowbackgames.com for a link to the Discord and more information about me and my work. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.